Hello and welcome, I'm your host KB and you're watching The Retrospective. Like a lot of kids growing up in the early 90s, I became a huge fan of the sport of basketball. And at the time, there wasn't a bigger name in the sport than Michael Jordan, aka the GOAT. No, the greatest of all time, not that type of GOAT. Part of his mainstream appeal was his affiliation with the brand Nike. This led to the creation of his own brand and his own signature line of sneakers, the Air Jordans, which are super successful to this day. Yo, Mars Blackman here with my main man, Michael Jordan. Yo, Mike, what makes you the best player in the universe? Is it the vicious stunts? No, Mars. Is it the haircut? No, Mars. Is it the shoes? No, Mars. With Jordan's popularity booming, Nike decided to target a younger demographic. And that's why in 1992, with the release of the Air Jordan 7s, they decided to do a promotional tie-in with Warner Brothers and release the Hair Jordans. This also featured a line of commercials featuring Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny. Hey, What's up? Gruesome, ain't it? <laughs> of course you know this means war. Air Jordan and Air Jordan. Who'd you expect? Air my friend? The odd pairing of Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny was seen as marketing genius. And the relationship between Nike and Warner Brothers continued until 1998. The commercials were such a hit that the green light was given for a full featured film starring Jordan and the Looney Tunes, and that's what led to the 1996 theatrical release of Space Jam. The film, directed by Joe Pitka, starts with Michael Jordan announcing his retirement from the game of basketball. This is loosely based on real life events where Jordan did in fact retire from the NBA. His retirement lasted throughout the 1993-94 season as Jordan cited his lack of desire to play the game. He also suffered the real life loss of his father, who had always wanted Michael to play baseball. This is where we find Michael in the film, where he's struggling with mediocrity in his new baseball career. While this is happening, a pint sized group of aliens known as the Nerdlux are sent to Earth to capture the Looney Tunes. They're sent there by their evil boss, Mr. Swackhammer, who's voiced by Danny DeVito. Brat is right. I've told you if I've told you once, I told you a thousand, 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 thousand times. We need new attractions. The plan is to take the Looney Tunes back to their home on Moron Mountain, which is an amusement park where they want to enslave them and make them a featured attraction. Understandably, the Looney Tunes don't really want to become slaves. And while noticing their height and athletic advantage over the diminutive little nerdlux, they trick them into deciding their fate via a basketball game. Alright, basketball it is. Basketball. Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> Alright. What is basketball? What's that? Beats me. We didn't have that no in school. Idea. Here's how it's done in the professional ranks. The National Basketball Association. Featuring the best players in the world. The best players in the world. The best! Unbeknownst to the Looney Tunes, the Nerdlux plan to steal the talents from, quote, the best players in the world. I put quote there because for any basketball fan of that era, sure, Charles Barkley and Patrick Ewing were superstars, but Muggsy Bogues and Sean Bradley... Now I know they were picked more for their visual characteristics, such as being unusually short and freakishly tall, but couldn't they have chucked in some notable stars like John Stockton or Hakeem the Dream Olajuwon? Now how they managed to steal the skills from the NBA players, I'm not too sure. I guess science and stuff. 
But either way, this helps transform them into the monstrous team known as the Monstars, and leads to quite a cool transformation sequence. Nonsensical skill stealing aside, this plot point actually leads to some of my favourite parts of the movie with the NBA stars trying to cope with their loss of abilities. A few more tests, gentlemen. Tests for electrolyte levels, glucose, CBCs, RBCs, etc. And we've scheduled a 12 lead stress test and neurological battery to a What are you saying? That I'm trying to disobey my mama? I didn't say that. You did, Muggsy. But I love my mama. Now fearing the newly transformed Monstars, the Looney Tunes seek out a retired MJ and drag him to their Toon world to help prepare for the big game. Jordan, no longer identifying himself as a basketball player, is quickly provided the motivation he needs. Don't play basketball anymore. I don't play basketball anymore. <laughs> Maybe you're chicken. Come here. <laughs> Let's play some basketball. After a brief foray to the surface where Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck go to Michael Jordan's house to retrieve his lucky basketball shorts, and yeah, I'm not really buying that that's Michael Jordan's humble abode either. They're followed by Stan Podolak, played by Wayne Knight, who's Michael Jordan's bumbling assistant as they head back to Looney Tune land. With Jordan and now Stan on board, the team gets to training. And we get a cool montage of Jordan getting his game back, set to the tune of Seals Fly Like an Eagle. And this is all part of the build-up that leads us to the night of the big game. Now, as typical sports movie tropes go, the tunes are easily dominated in the first half of the game by the bigger and badder monsters, sending a dejected tune squad to their locker room. Then, after MJ gives his best Phil Jackson impression, Bugs manages to coax the tunes into making a comeback by feeding them a placebo he calls Michael's secret stuff. As the tides slowly start to turn to the Looney Tunes' favour, the Monstars decide to get physical. And after quickly clearing out the Toon Squad's bench due to injuries, the team's dangerously close to forfeit. At this point, who else to come in and save the day but... Bill Murray. Yep. Bill Murray. When Swackhammer shows his interest in Michael becoming an attraction at his amusement park, Michael heroically decides to up the stakes and put himself on the line in an effort to win back the skills of his NBA buddies. With 10 seconds remaining in the game, the Toons regain the ball, and Michael making use of the rules or lack thereof in Looney Tune land, he stretches his arm out in true Toon fashion to make the game winning basket as the clock very slowly ticks down to zero. With their defeat, the Monstars are quickly chastised by Mr. Swackhammer. Realising with their newfound powers they no longer have to take his crap, they quickly send him soaring back to Moron Mountain. In keeping with their original deal, the Monstars give the NBA players skills back, returning themselves to their original nerd luck forms. They also mention how much they despise living on Moron Mountain, and after proving just how loony they can be, the Looney Tunes decide that they can stay with them in Looney Tune Land. 
With the day one, our hero Michael Jordan makes his triumphant return to the game of baseball. But shortly after returning the skills to the NBA players, they quickly managed to coax him back into the world of basketball. Yay. While the movie itself is no masterpiece and was heavily panned by critics upon its release, it did strike a chord with kids like myself who opted to see it for my 10th birthday. It went on to be a huge box office hit and to this day is the highest grossing basketball related film of all time. Now sure the plot was quite thin and we had NBA players instead of trained actors in some parts which you know led to some flat acting scenes but at least we had the basketball players doing what they do best which is play basketball. I mean it's not like we had Michael Jordan playing some sort of rapping genie who came out of a boombox to grant wishes. Oh uh, yeah. Sorry Shaq. I am Kazam! From a technical standpoint the movie was great. Featuring a blend of live action and traditional cell animation, which was something not seen since Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and the effects still hold up to this day. The soundtrack includes the usual orchestral fare that you'd expect from a Looney Tunes production, but also blends it well with a modern mix of hip hop and R&B, including R. Kelly's I Believe I Can Fly, which went on to win a Grammy that year for the best song written for a motion picture. So overall the production value is very high, which is what you'd expect from a Warner Brothers production and it makes the movie a real treat to watch. Now sure, the movie has its faults, but to me it's still a classic, and a perfect representation of everything good about the 90s. It was a mishmash of pop culture references and commercialism, all tied together with a pretty bow. As can be expected with any kid-friendly blockbuster from the 90s, a ton of merchandise was pumped out, including action figures, clothing, and even a video game. They even did a new line of commercials as a tie-in for the toy line released with McDonald's Happy Meals. Let's see what we have in the way of talent. There are eight toys from the movie Space Jam starring Michael Jordan. You can jam with bugs or make a move with Taz. You can collect them all to connect them all. One with every Happy Meal you buy. It's a slam dunk. I'm available for endorsement. Now for years there had been rumours swirling around about a possible Space Jam sequel. And earlier this year it was actually confirmed that we would see a Space Jam 2 featuring LeBron James. As he's just recently signed a contract with Warner Brothers Pictures. Now, having seen LeBron act in movies like Trainwreck, it does appear he has some acting chops. Whether Michael Jordan will be involved with the project is unknown, but I for one would love to see a cameo. Michael, do you hear that? They don't think you can play the game anymore. There's only one way to find out. So far, no details have surfaced about the movie or what the storyline may be. But all I know is, I, for one, am excited at the prospect of seeing a Space Jam sequel in theatres 20 years after seeing the original. Once again, thanks very much for watching and supporting the show. Please remember to hit like and subscribe to the channel, and even share the episodes with your friends. And I'll catch you guys on the next episode of The Retrospective. <laughs>